This is one of the most well-documented tornadoes in history, and it happened 67 years ago. The course of meteorology was about to change forever, and it was thanks to one individual, Dr. Tetsuya Fujita an engineer turned meteorologist, was boots on the ground on behalf of the United States Weather Bureau in the wake of this tornado. His unique background, analytical prowess, and unwavering tenacity made him the perfect man for the job. Over the course of the next two years, he would put together the most comprehensive tornado survey to date and establish some of the most important foundational pieces of the mystery behind nature's elusive whirlwinds. June 20th, 1957, Fargo, North Dakota. Meteorologist Ray Jensen arrives at work at the Weather Bureau office at Fargo's Hector Airport, just north of town. It is 4 p.m. as he prepares for his usual solo shift by poring over the weather charts. While weather observation stations were few and far between in rural North Dakota, the latest surface observations showed that Fargo was squarely in the warm sector of an approaching low pressure system. The upper air charts were several hours old, but showed westerly flow prevailed in the upper levels. The adiabatic chart, or skew T, revealed atmospheric instability. The 26-year-old meteorologist knew that the stage was set for thunderstorms. While still in the calm before the storm, he got to work writing severe weather bulletin templates for later that evening. Jensen watches cumulus towers explode up into the atmosphere over 30 miles west of his airport vantage point. He begins to put his severe weather bulletins to work, sending them over teletype to be broadcasted over the airwaves. Minutes later, the first rumbles of thunder were heard from his office. Little did he know that a tornado was already in progress. At 6.25, Jensen would see a tornado 20 miles west of the airport. This would prompt him to issue a tornado warning to broadcast over TV and radio. While it would eventually retreat back up into the clouds, the ominous lowered rotating cloud from which the tornado came would hover closer and closer to downtown Fargo. As the public receives the message of a possible tornado, the brave ones venture outside to witness the oncoming spectacle. The majority of people had never seen one before, so many of them have their cameras in tow. The sky would come in contact with the ground once again a few miles west of Fargo city limits. People's home cameras, typically used for capturing family get-togethers or vacations, were now aimed at the sky. The twister would meander east-southeast, looking almost stationary at moments. As pictures and even some video was taken, the tornado would cross into city limits, impacting the Golden Ridge subdivision. While many residents were able to flee thanks to Jensen's one-hour advanced warning and the tornado's slow speed, those that opted to remain home would be subjected to the tornado's wrath. As the tornado crawled slowly over the subdivision, the homes in its path were simply obliterated. Those surrounding the tornado would continue to take imagery as the vortex became shrouded in debris. Little do these onlookers know at the time that these were the last moments of 10 people on the ground. The tornado would traverse the southern end of the Fargo rail yard and into the residential blocks north of downtown. More intense damage to homes would occur before the tornado would cross the Red River into Minnesota farmland tracking for several more miles before seemingly thinning out of existence. The thunderstorm overhead would continue eastward, producing another two tornadoes near the Minnesotan towns of Glendon and Dale. Back in the Golden Ridge subdivision, 36-year-old Mercedes Munson is rushing home from work after a terrifying phone call from her eldest daughter, Phyllis. Before the line went dead, Phyllis screamed that the tornado was hitting their home. Mercedes comes upon a scene of utter devastation. Their home and surrounding blocks were reduced to swaths of timber. She finds her 14-year-old son, Leroy, amongst the chaos, unscathed. But he had been in another house babysitting when the tornado came through. As for Phyllis and the other five Munson children, they are nowhere to be found. 
Over the next several hours, Mercedes's world would be forever turned upside down. That night, she would identify the bodies of four of her children in the hospital morgue. Her remaining two children would succumb to their injuries soon thereafter. The following morning, 200 miles away in Bismarck, North Dakota, Gerald Munson, who had been away from home for work, quickly finds the local paper as he was unable to reach his wife the night prior after hearing of the bad weather. He finds his last name listed six times in the victims two weeks later in Chicago. Meteorologist Ferguson Hall of the U.S. Weather Bureau head office came to the University of Chicago's Department of Meteorology. He presented a number of high-quality photographs of the storm that ravaged Fargo. This particularly piqued the interest of 36-year-old Tetsuya Fujita, who years earlier used physical evidence to calculate the detonation altitude of the nuclear bomb that leveled Nagasaki. Dr. Horace Byers, the man in charge of the department, dispatched Fujita to put his unique forensic engineering skills to work to uncover what he can from the evidence of the Fargo tornado. With the help of local broadcast meteorologist Dewey Burquist, Fujita would collect photographs, films, and observational statements from those that had witnessed the tornado. In a couple months' time, Fujita had collected 185 photographs, 12 sketches from observing meteorologists, and 5 film reels from 53 different perspectives spanning from 25 miles west of Fargo all the way to the farm fields of Minnesota. This was an unprecedented amount of photographic evidence of a tornado. Additionally, he got his hands on the aerial photographs of the damage taken just a day after the tornado. With all of this evidence began the real work for Fujita. He would begin to stitch the story of the clouds together through photogrammetry, the process of using photographs to acquire accurate measurements. Fujita painstakingly pulled together the complete picture of the entire life cycle of the Fargo tornado. Not only did he get the narrative of the tornado's life, but the parent thunderstorm as well. He would conclude that the parent thunderstorm was responsible for five tornadoes across a 50-mile span. Each of the five tornadoes appeared one after another underneath a rotating cloud base, part of a larger mother cloud what we would call today the mesocyclone of a supercell. This mother cloud was composed of key features, those being the wall cloud, tail cloud, and collar cloud, all terms that are still used today for supercell thunderstorm anatomy. With the five movies that he had collected, Fujita then was able to calculate speeds of the different cloud features, and even some of the rotational speeds of the Fargo tornado's funnel as it tore through town. After two years of diligent and tedious work, Fujita would publish a 67-page research paper through the U.S. Weather Bureau. It would compile the overall meteorological breakdown, the evolution of the five tornadoes, the triangulation of storm-scale features with their evolutions, and the plot of various speeds and sizes of the Fargo tornado into one cohesive narrative of the storm that traversed the greater Fargo area. Accompanying the narrative were nearly 100 carefully crafted figures, all in incredible detail. Nothing with this level of detail had been done before, and all of a sudden, Dr. Fujita was now at the forefront of tornado science. Fujita would come to the strong conclusion that tornadoes were not a random occurrence, but rather the careful orchestration of ingredients and storm features. These conclusions were not only groundbreaking for the future of predicting tornadoes, but also revealed that tornadoes could in fact be studied. While the Fargo tornado family was a rare occurrence of a highly documented, slow-moving and strong thunderstorm, Fujita would need a more consistent way to unlock the secrets of Mother Nature's tornadoes. His answer lied in those aerial photographs of the damage. Maybe the damage left behind was the key.